today we have Jerry Ellsworth and Rick Johnson with us. They're part of the Technical Illusions group. So yeah, just tell me what Cast AR is. After you, Rick. Uh, let's see. I we did a update video uh, last night, and I said this a hundred times already. Is the uh, so <laughs> it's a uh, primarily a pair of glasses that you put on, and they uh, project out a 3D graphic uh, holographic like projection. Uh, these projections appear as models, as objects right in front of you. You can move around them. You can interact with them uh, just as a, just as if they're right there. Uh, the, the classic example I use to explain it is uh, people who've seen the original Star Wars movie, the Princess Leia being projected out of R2-D2 or uh, R2-D2 and Chewbacca playing that kind of virtual chess. It's, yeah. it's sort of like that movie magic, only now we can actually do it. And there's uh, even more to it than that. We've got, <laughs> we have peripherals um, that go along with it. We have a magic wand for doing 3D input into this, uh, this 3D volume of uh, space, so it gives you uh, full six degrees of freedom movement. You can go in and poke pixels if you want, move characters around. Um, we have an RFID grid that uh, was within reach, now it's not. Um, but it, uh, it's a, an array of RFID pickup coils, and you can put RFID enabled um, props, just have these inexpensive paper RFIDs on them, and we can measure their position on the table for like. Dungeons and Dragons type games or Warhammer and Magic the Gathering, anything that you want to uniquely track across the surface and either have virtual objects and creatures spawn from them or augment with stats or calculate distances. Uh, the the other thing we kind of forgot to talk about is the the heart of the the whole system is the tracking uh, solution. That it's our own custom design. That it has a uh, camera with a specialized FPGA that breaks down infrared points out in the physical world. And then the computer can track them up to 120 hertz. Yeah, sub millimeter accuracy. Yeah. So super, super accurate. Um, and then uh, for folks that uh, love VR experiences, um, the uh, fully immersive type experiences where the entire world is um, synthetic and created by the computer, we have a clip on that clips onto the front of the glasses that converts them from our projected augmented reality mode to um, full virtual reality with super wide field of view and 93% and, uh, uh, fill factor on the pixels so the, the pixels are nice and sharp and you don't get that screen door effect that you see on some of the other head mount displays. Mm -hmm. I, uh, there's a couple of us that have uh, Oculus Rift at Tweak Town and uh, I'm really excited to try your version out. Yeah, uh, so our initial tests are uh, uh, it looks pretty awesome. It's nice because this, uh, we're using freeform optics to do the, the reflectors to bring the image back to your eyes, so we can correct for all the warping. So, um, like a, a lot of these other head mount displays that just have a, a lens pointing at an LCD, mm -hmm. it, it works a lot at the ends. You get chromatic aberrations, um, so that means the red, green, and blue colors kind of smear out. Yeah. So. Ours is almost a 100% reflective system, so we don't get chromatic aberrations, and we can pull those pixels that are way out on the edges back into where you can use them. And we just uh, put out an update today that we uh, got the integration into the uh, Perception 2.0 drivers that allow us to support uh, existing 3D games in the virtual reality space, so such as uh, Half-Life or TF2 or Skyrim, uh, we now support. Awesome. That's, that's going to be amazing. <laughs> We're, uh, uh, we reached our goal pretty early, um, but we still have a long ways to go as far as uh, raising funds. We'd like to raise more so that we can do more software and drivers, and that all takes engineers. Um, you know, we have enough to do the production, so everything we get beyond this um, is hiring engineers to make more drivers for, like, to do VR and AR experiences. Nice. Um... So I remember in your in your first video, the one you did, I guess, sitting in the hotel room, um, <laughs> you said that it was more kind of like for the casual gamer, the the like tabletop gamer kind of person. Um, but you just said that you know it's been integrated into a couple other games, so that kind of almost kills my next question. But do you see this being big for games like Battlefield Four, like because they have a commander mode in Battlefield Four where you can use a map of the battlefield? I was taking a look at that, and I was thinking that would be a killer app for our, our system. 
uh, we'll have to work with those guys to get support or get someone will have to hack into the drivers to make that happen. But yeah, on, on the, the opposite end of it, uh, we've had interest uh, from people inside the military for doing exactly that type of visualization. And so it would be uh, ironic and cool to be able to say that we're doing both, both spectrums of the video game and the, the, the true military type simulation and stuff. That would be really cool. Um, yeah, so the <clears throat> your question about the casual versus kind of the hardcore gamers, um, I personally I see a lot of opportunity to have new game experiences in the casual space because um, the, the glasses are transparent, you can wear them, you can sit around the table with your friends and you can look across the table and when they you know send their troops over and destroy your Tesla coil or something, you uh, you can get you know look at them and be angry and you just have this really cool social inter interactions. And we've already seen that with some of the demo games that Rick put together. Um, and you can talk about my favorite is the zombie maze. Yeah, it was uh, early on. It was just an input experiment that if you led a character by a wand, kind of like uh, 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 I'm trying to think of uh, the guy with the pipe leading the rats. Pipe Piper. Yeah. Uh, something like that, if that was an interesting input experiment. Uh, and so it would turn into a leaning a character around uh, a maze full of zombies, and then it turned into a multiplayer game of leaning a character around. And so people would interact in a, a different virtual experience from each person's perspective, but they shared the same physical experience. And you would see people kind of shoving each other and you know doing little sword fights with the magic wand and other things like that. It, it was a, a very interesting people watching experience as well as understanding how people might interact in the, in the physical side. I really liked how <clears throat> you could just look across the table and you could kind of tell what the other person was doing, like the attack that they were going to mount on you just by the, the things they were doing with the uh, wand. You'd see them kind of swirling the wand, which means they might have been gathering up zombies to try to drag over to your area. <clears throat> or you could lean down and kind of <clears throat> look across the uh, the horizon a little bit, and you could look out and look for clues of where they are in the map, but by doing that, you were revealing that you were looking for them to attack them, so then they would react and move to a different part of the map. Super, oh. super fun. That, that sounds really cool. I, uh, again, I can't wait to play with it when I get mine. Um, I guess one of the last questions, because I know you guys are short on time, um, so are you familiar with the company Six Cents? The um, yeah, that's the Razor Hydra. The Razor Hydra, yes. Yeah, the Hydra guys. They're incorporating 3D printing into their system by allowing users to download an open source 3D design of the receptacle that the stem pack fits into. Users can take this file, modify it, and then print it on their own 3D printer to make controllers that can be used with the stem system. My question is, do you plan on open sourcing any of the components of CAST AR? So, as far as hackability of our system. <clears throat> We're leaving the system uh, very open, um, not completely open source, but the SDKs are very open. And then, uh, for instance, our RFID grid is one of the places I think is going to be pretty interesting for hackers. Um, we'll leave uh, access to all these coils, and they'll be able to drive them themselves. Um, we're not going to hide our our protocols for doing the LED tracking, so folks can just use their Arduino to modulate LEDs, make their own trackable devices and props and um, in that regard. I don't know, I, I imagine if there's something that makes sense for us to just release so that people can 3D print, we would. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head except for maybe the RFID bases. That's that's what I was thinking, the base, like, because that, that's what they're doing. All their open sourcing is just the little port that their pack plugs into, and you have to build around that, and then you can print it. We also have... Uh, Optional, you can buy the tracking, tracking cameras yeah. uh, separately in our setup. So I imagine people will be adapting that to pretty interesting stuff, either hooking them to their existing head mount display so they can get absolute um, positioning, or, uh, like you said, making a rifle or something by 3D printing, yeah. something to slip the tracker in there. So, yeah, ultimately the bases are just a convenience factor for people who have existing DD or Warhammer uh, miniatures. It's just a, a quick way to, to plot them on. Yep. The, the, the RFID grid uses common availability RFID tags, and so if a person wants to create their own base and use their own tags, 
they can completely bypass uh, what we're doing. Uh, they're more than free to do that. Okay. Yeah, our, our tracking, um, our tracking is really, really good. Uh, we use some of the Hydra stuff before, and uh, ours is absolute. So we're super um, excited about that because if you move one inch over, you actually measure one inch um, on the sensor. And there's no warping or anything like that with magnetic fields. Oh, well, that's that's amazing. Yeah. Our first one was a. A Hydra, modified Hydra. Yeah, we did we did a lot of early prototyping with the Hydra. And, yeah. uh, we created a, a fishing wand that we <laughs> put the, the guts of a Hydra on the end of a tip that you could extend out and uh, tap around on the table and all that kind of stuff. And I, it worked worked fairly well. It was pretty cool. Uh, um, I kind of wish we integrated this into our wand design, but uh, people kind of rejected it by the for the ugliness factor of it. But um, you could have it telescoped in. It's like an antenna on a radio telescoped in so you have it kind of in short mode and then if you needed to reach across the table you just went just pulled it out and then you reached across the table. <laughs> um, of course that can be all virtualized. Yeah. Is there anything you want to say to your backers at this point? Uh, other than uh, a fond appreciation for all of them that uh, if you want to see something for us to produce or a, a video or a demonstration idea there's Currently, a, a lot of people that want to see a, a video from inside of a cockpit with retro material around it to do uh, uh, space uh, simulations. I forget the one big Kickstarter space game that uh, has taken off, but there's a big interest in that to see what it looks like, and so we'll probably be doing an update video uh, about that uh, in the next few days. Oh, yeah, and we have some updates coming. We've been working with some indie developers. Uh, a lady came over just a day ago in, like, in 45 minutes or so. She had her her game, uh, Centuries or something? What's, uh, I can't remember what it's called exactly, but it's a music game with a bunch of spinning discs and it just mapped great to our space. So we'll be showing update videos and some case studies of that. Well, cool. Well, I can't wait to see it. Um, I wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.